Malcolm was amazing. He kept on saying, you know, you can do this, you can do this. He said, I said, are you serious? The vile comments about these people being skinny is horrible. We women have a tendency to check and just make sure that we're still good enough. For International Women's Day, David Jones brought together some of Australia's most influential women to talk about what it really means to be a woman in today's society. I'm passionate about making a difference in women's lives. That's what I'm most looking forward to as well, hearing from the different women on the panel, hearing from different people's experiences. I'm really excited to learn a lot today. I think it would just be a lot of fun. When you have a group of interesting, dynamic women coming together around a table, interesting things will always happen. What kind of responsibility do you feel, Edwina, in such a beautiful magazine with Vogue and really glorifying a privilege to some degree? Not everybody can access it. What parameters do you work within when you're putting an edition together? Different parts of our business have very you know, different objectives, I, I suppose. So the magazine, yes, it is, it is beautiful. It is privileged. It's unapologetically about luxury and high fashion. Even things like Vogue Codes, like trying to work out where we can influence young minds who are attracted to the fashion world and the glamour of what Vogue is in a positive way um, is where I feel a responsibility. And that needs to be rethought all the time because the boundaries are changing. I mean, certainly in the social media area, it's you know, it can be dangerous. Like, we do, we do edit very, or certainly abusive comments, because I don't think that we, you know, we're publishers, and it doesn't matter which platform we're publishing on, we still have a responsibility um, to the majority, and especially, you know, to the talent or the people who are being mentioned. So we're talking about abusive comments towards a certain model, and people yeah, say she's ugly model, or fat exactly. or whatever else. And interestingly, probably the most abusive, and I know this is probably very controversial, but sometimes when there's an image published of somebody who people think is skinny, the things that are said yes. about, and the vile comments about these people being skinny is horrible. Mm -hmm. And this is probably the only time they've appeared on a Vogue channel anywhere. So, and they may have even been tagged in it, so they're reading that. Mm -hmm. And even that is not acceptable, no matter what people think about models being too thin. The technological revolution with social media has been unbelievably positive in many ways. But one of the things that really worries me about it is that it has unleashed a very low level of civility in okay. the way we communicate and, and uh, talk to people. I'd like to think that 10 years ago, these people would never have said these things out loud. And now through social media, they think they have a viable platform to be really uncivilised. And that's one of the great things about human life is that, you know, over the centuries, we have tended to become more civilised. It seems like we've, I hope we haven't peaked and we mm. can kind of Regressing encourage, encourage more civilised discourse. Anybody with a computer can get their ideas, their thoughts, their opinions, their non-facts out there. And that gets legitimised because it exists. Although it, they're blurred lines as well. Like, where do people get this vitriol from? Sometimes when you look at, well, sometimes I've looked at, someone might say, I had one bloke who wrote to me, can you be any more pathetic? And I wrote back, yes, because obviously I can. <laughs> <laughs> but when you actually look at the track record of the tweets people like that have sent out, it's every four minutes to yeah. a different person. There's a yeah. mathematical equation. The number of followers compared to the number of tweets, yes. that's, that's where you get your trolls. Yeah. You, you'll get four followers to 47,000 tweets. And Definition also, troll. Many of us work in the media, but when you have a look at what is put out there, there's criticism, who looks hot, who does not. These might be Academy Award nominees. But and also, we're talking about what they wear. But let's remember, everyone knows the story of how Facebook started. Mark Zuckerberg what? was rating women at his college campus yep. on who's hot and who's not. I mean, that, that is kind of a metaphor for what we've ended up with. Where did your self-confidence come? Is it hard-earned? I didn't always have a huge amount of self-confidence in what I could do, and that's where actually Malcolm was amazing. He kept on saying, you know, you can do this, you can do this. He said, I said, are you serious? You think I can do that? And he'd say, of course you can. People's confidence gets turned on by different events and different phenomena. And 
you know, it's a growing thing. Like, I don't think anybody is just comes out with self-confidence. Well, some people do, but they're the exception, not the rule. I think what really worries me is when I interview young female engineers and I interview young male engineers, and I say to the girls, you know, what, what do you think about this? Um, can, you do, can you do that? Can you do this? And, and they, they always say, oh, no, I'm not very good at that. No, I, I can't yes. really do that. Oh, I've just started, but I'm, I'm just a beginner. Whereas the boys, if they've done, like, one bit of code using that language, I'd be like, yeah, yeah, I've got that handled. It's really stark, the contrast between them. And um, I think that, you know, all of, all of the stuff that we're talking about, like media, the bullying, the... the uh, you know, what women should look like, what women should be like. It's, it's impacting girls across all fields and across how they see themselves. And uh, I think what's really important to young girls is that they, they get out there and they do something, like anything, so that they know that they can actually have an impact and they know that they can, they can make some kind of change in the world. They can then apply, apply that to all the other areas of their life. Well, you know, if I, if I just do a little thing here and it has an impact in the real world, then you know, maybe I can have an impact in the real world across all these different areas. But as women, we do have a tendency to have an internal dialogue that tends towards the negative. Yeah. Like, I, I'll give you a, a perfect example. When I get dressed every morning to go on air, I'll sort of put something on, I'll just have a quick check and just make sure that, you know, bits are not sticking out and, and all of that. My husband, when he gets dressed in the morning, even when he was 30 kilos heavier than he is now, because he just lost a whole lot of weight, he could walk past a mirror naked and think, that's a fine figure of weight. <laughs> <laughs> Men always look for the positive in themselves, generally, I, I'm broad generalisation. We women have a tendency to check and just make sure that we're still good enough. Is it learnt or are we born like that? What do you think, Donna? I do know that the best piece of advice of recent time is, is, is to be as impressive as a mediocre white man. <laughs> and maybe you could tell your students <laughs> that, yes? Just be as impressive as that. Um, no, I think it's a combination of learnt behaviour and born behaviour. I think the important thing to get a, a handle off is that inner voice, which can be so damaging, yeah, particularly absolutely. to women. And, and that voice you hear in your head has to be what your best friend would say to you. Yeah. When you think you've stuffed up or that you're silly or, you've, or embarrassed yourself, what would your best friend's voice say in your head? And that is the voice, you don't go to a best friend, but you develop that for yourself. Yeah. And keep that voice in your head all the time saying, that was great. And I think it's yeah. really important as well to spread the message about things like imposter syndrome, where girls who uh, achieve things and also high achieving men as well, think they don't deserve their achievements. It's something that a lot of high achieving women feel. And if they know about, if they know it's very common, then maybe they'll discount those thoughts from their head when they, when they think them. I think the stage is a fascinating place that is showing where women are. The greatest comics you can see at the moment are women, particularly when they're over 40, oh, I think. that is because the joy of this. Joy. Yeah. They, there are no rules. They yeah, guards down. care less. <laughs> but see, I would say that in, in my role, because I, I started on the Today Show well past 40, um, which surprised a lot of people, but I think I get to say things that I probably wouldn't have had the courage to yeah, say right. if I'd been 28. Actually, increasingly you are, Lisa. Yes. I'm sorry yeah. about that. Yeah. No, just, I love I it. Just, I love well, it. I, I just... I well, think, it's the payoff I for think, wrinkles. Jeez, they've got to exactly, something. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> and, and I think what people want more than ever is authenticity. Lucy, we're kind of the same age, all of... Yeah. You've got very good foundation, but um, <laughs> we're, we're all kind of the same age. But one I'm of the 73, things... but I've had a lot of work done. <laughs> one of the things we were raised as was this notion of the superwoman. Mm. Do you remember Which that? Which is terrifying. Yeah. And we were mm. meant to be perfect. That was exactly. nonsense. And, and it's only now, as you say, Lisa, that it's actually imperfection that draws other people to you. And I think the whole um, plastic surgery and all of the, the sort of airbrushing and all of that, I think there's a real reaction against that now. Do you? I think yeah. the human eye is seeking out faces that haven't been tampered with, images that, that are more raw and more real because you see less of it, so you want more of it. Yeah. Oh, it's suddenly normality is exotic. <laughs> yes. yes. And, and you know, people who've had way too much work done to their face look so obviously unauthentic. Yeah. You yeah. Know, and they don't you, look young, they just look weird. I know. <laughs> Do 
I don't know if I was born with a sense of personal style, but I do know my mother used to encourage it in me. But this led to me as about a two or three year old insisting on going out on a bright sunny day in raincoats and mismatching socks. And I did wear my great grandmother's bloomers on top of stockings and things when I was about 12 and 13. So maybe all that self-expression ends up leading you to a place where you're confident to express yourself. Lucy, what about you? Well, um, I, for a little while, had to do dressmaking at school and I was sensationally awful at it. <laughs> so ever since then, I've had a huge respect for people who actually can make clothes, design clothes, etc. So I've always, I'm quite a visual person, so I'm very interested in the visuals of, of design, but most of all, I have enormous respect for the people who have the talent to do it. Have you got fashion icons that you think, oh, I love what they do? Well, fashion icons are usually about six feet. So if you think mm -hmm. about fashion icons, you're going to be very disappointed when you compare yourself to how you look compared oh, okay. to fashion icons. <laughs> so I, I try to keep it simple and pretty basic. What about you, Donna? So for me, it's uh, three things. It was reading Dolly magazine as I was growing up. My mother made my clothes, but I had, uh, and I was very grateful to her for that. They I'm were sorry, made, she made what you clothes. asked her to make? Yes, absolutely, in the style of what was shown in Dolly, so she was a great imitator. And the third one, a third influence was I had a, an aunt who lived in Sydney, Auntie Pamela, who was my Auntie Mame, an incredibly stylish woman, she remains so today in her, uh, in her late 70s, and she was my style icon, and I think I kind of, even though she wears colour and I don't, I still think there's an essence in there. What about you? Um, well, I found clothing distressing. I mean, we lived on <laughs> hand-me-downs, and the in this tiny town I grew up in, the publicans, uh, they were my parents' best friends and they had five daughters. So you'd be at mass on Sunday and you'd be looking at Julia in a green crimpoline and you go, Shh, I'll be wearing that in four years. Because <laughs> <laughs> there were so many girls to go through it. Carla, what about you? I love that kind of hodgepodge of pulling things together. Vintage doors are my absolute favourite. I love colour and I love texture and anything that I think um, I'll, I'll enjoy wearing and feel fun and feel me in. I'm just, no. Yeah, Alita, what about you? It is wonderful to be old enough to know to never wear satin. <laughs> oh. Shiny fabric is the most unforgiving fabric for just about any woman. Don't ever wear shiny. Have you got like a mantra or someone you go to or what do you I've do? I've got one that is, uh, this too will pass. Yes. Just take three deep breaths and this say, this two will pass. pass, and over time, I, I, I believe it. Very similar to Edwina's. I think just put, keep putting one foot in front of the other and breathe deeply. OK, great. Donna, have you got one? Yeah, stay alive, basically. <laughs> so um, mine is, uh, be yourself, everyone else is taken. Great. Carla, what about you? I probably do a similar thing to what I try and encourage all of our young people to do, which is to recognise the resilience that is innate within them and is almost for us, for many of us, particularly for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, a part of our DNA. You don't end up being the longest surviving culture on the planet yeah. without being incredibly resilient. Yeah. That's a part of them. It's in every single one of them. It, it lives and breathes inside of them and that they just have to take the time to recognise it and just feel it, own it and then embody it. So your mantra? Uh, there are many and probably depends on the situation. My mum gave me the serenity prayer when I was eight years old and it helped me to see that there are times in our lives when there are many things that are unacceptable and things we see in the world that are unacceptable and we need to have the courage to change what we can but we also need to have the wisdom to see what we can't change and at that point in time, doesn't mean never, I think we almost turn ourselves inside out sometimes fight, fighting with what is. And I'm not saying let's accept the things that are unacceptable in the world because I'm not about that, but there are moments when there's actually nothing you can do about that and there's a whole slice of heaven in acceptance sometimes. Instead of seeing that life happens to you, if you can see that it happens for you, you'll change your whole response. Thank you everybody. You were all fabulous. Thank you. Thank you.